a few opening re remarks. Um, uh, just a, a, a huge thank you to, um, to Alex and to Nicholas and to Hannah. Um, this is really true. Since, since in the past five or six years, there have been many galleries that have uh, very kindly invited me to organize shows. And I, I never felt, um, even from the, the onset, I never felt like it was quite the right context. Um, uh, and I immediately knew this was due to its kind of intellectual history, its history of conceptual art, um, and uh, the high degree to, of professionalism with which this institution operates. And I highly recommend every artist or curator or critic in this room take the opportunity, if you ever get it, to, to work with this gallery. Um, the second opening remark is just that it's, it's I'm, I'm a bit tired after the end of, you know, a very serious installation week. Um, and it, it means that my remarks will be rather offhand, and, and perhaps it will make for a more uh, uh, enjoyable event for you if I'm overly uh, uh, loose and colorful in my language and ideas. So to get to your, yeah. your, your question about, you know, Chardin and why Chardin now and the potential political meaning of Chardin now, you know, I think every, every era or epoch uh, realizes itself in, in certain cultural forms that answer that moment of civilization. So many people have discussed how, um, you know, uh, what's an example? Like uh, Madame Bovary and the invention of the novel fit uh, that there was now leisure time and, and certain people had this extra time and thus we got the novel as a format. Um, and I don't think it's a mistake uh, that in the last 15 years, you know, we've seen this huge explosion across the world of, of yoga, for instance. I don't think we should take that for granted, that now yoga is so commonplace, this very specific, small Asian practice um, is now universal, and I think it might be because of um, the way we live our lives now, and cell phones, and internet, and, and the universal pace uh, and tempo of our existence now, and this idea that we have to look in this tiny little thing that so regiments the ins and outs of our life, and yoga is this much more free-flowing practice. Uh, I don't do yoga. Chardin is my yoga. Um, I have, this is very honest. I have to do all these art fairs now. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, you have to fly to these cities and you wake up and you stand in this very hot little white room all day. And uh, I found if I went to the museum in whatever city I was in very early, uh, I found Chardin. And uh, these paintings off offer just an unmatched level of peace and tranquility. They're amongst the most balanced paintings in the history of art, um, uh, equal in my mind to Bellini um, or Raphael or Piero della Francesca in their perfection. Um, but unlike those masters that paint, you know, God and Christ and the King, subjects that I'm only, uh, you know, remotely familiar with, the, the majesty of a, of a Chardin painting is, you know, the very stuff that's on this table next to me. Um, so there are two in London, two Chardins, uh, at the National Gallery in Gallery 33. They're not still lifes uh, per se, but I highly recommend the next time you're stressed out or um, you know, you're, you're a little too busy, particularly with technological problems or work, go and, and look at the Chardin. I think it offers a almost out-of-body experience. Um, it's my favorite thing to do in the world more than anything, is to, to look at the paintings of this man who lived in the 18th century. Um, so that's just a kind of personal in. That's like what this guy means to me. He's this uh, slowed down time. That's very personal. Yeah. yeah. I had the opportunity to go and see them yesterday uh, at the National, and uh, I do recommend it, particularly as they're very cool gallery spaces. So it's well worth the, uh, even to get out the heat. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I think particularly getting back to the sort of the image or the quality of the Chardin paintings, they have a kind of stillness and a slowness is what you're sort of getting at, which is, I suppose, what the yogic meditative point. Um, but how that, in effect, maybe that slowness of observation and the sort of that curve and craft of looking, 
I think, how that has sort of led you into the selection of these works and how these artists perhaps, although not aesthetically in any way perhaps similar to Chardin, his work, they kind of evoke or kind of show something of his kind of uh, attention to these kind of details of the overlooked. Um, can you talk about how these works you sort of selected or sort of how they came about into this, you know, into this show? Yeah. You, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, you could maybe say there's three, there's three parts to an artist and it's, um, there's the artist person, um, there's the artist's career, and there's the artist's work. Uh, and I think all three of these things are, are somewhat important into how we look at art. And uh, the relationships between Chardin and these three artists uh, interfaces on all three of those, those ways. Um, so as far as a, a career goes, um, Chardin was very successful. Um, amongst the m most successful artists of his time. Uh, he won the grand prize when he was 28, the, the French grand prize, and he lived at the Louvre most of his life. Um, but he was never super famous, and he was never super financially successful. He had made a good living. He was what we would call like a pensioner. Um, you know, part of his, his income from the king was he got free lodgings. Um, other artists didn't work that way. They'd rather have the money. But because Chardin pretty much only made very small paintings in this very unattractive genre, um, they were never that sought after. So, you know, Henrik Olesen, um, or B. Wirtz, almost everybody in the show, to be honest, they're all successful artists. They're all artists who have had museum shows and have a following, but, but almost none of them, their work is... Um, uh, on the cover of non-art magazines. Almost none of them's work is, is blue chip. Um, and I love them for this. I'm not, I'm not a, afraid to admit it. I, I, I really believe in art that is not, um, not that it's for a select audience or it's esoteric, but just that it has an integrity to itself that sometimes means it's, it's not gonna be a kind of mainstream hit. So all of these artists have this and, and many of the artists have dropped out of the art world even. Um, so that's a kind of career affiliation yeah. in the abstract, and we can talk about more specific artists. Um, but then also Chardin was extremely slow as an artist. There are maybe 240 paintings uh, that exist from this man, um, which over the course of 60 years, you know, if you do the math, that's very few paintings. This is the era of Rococo, when all these artists had these massive workshops helping them produce and produce and produce, um, Chardin just didn't do it. He worked very, very, very slowly. Um, and the flip side of this, the art market ramification of this, Chardin was one of the first artists to have a modern, shall we say modern, art market. Because he made so little, there was this great desire for his paintings. And ambassadors from all the other countries, from Spain and Italy, would come and say, please, please, please put us on your waiting list. Um, and the scarcity that we now all, you know, uh, enforce and recommend on our artists, Chardin was, was one of the first. Um, but nevertheless, despite all of those pressures, he just still made these, um, you know, simple paintings of, of cups and saucers and breadcrumbs and old fish at a very small scale, when I'm sure he could have scaled it up. I'm sure there was a me to Chardin who said to him, could you make one bigger, you know? Could you put some gold in it? You know, there's no gold. This is a man who lived at the Louvre for 50 years. There's no gold in any of his paintings. Um, it's copper and tin. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and this, the images that he depicts, those systems and these very lowly, uh, sorry, lowly objects. And in fact, if you actually, in the uh, press release, the one quote that you give was, uh, Chardin is the irrefutable witness who makes other painters look like liars. And I think it's that sense of the, this almost testimonial depiction of reality that also forms a kind of comfort. There's a security about what we're looking at in the work. You know, this is that. Um, and it, I suppose it rings true or rings more now, has resonances when we think of post-truth or the current situation about the status or the rogue nature of an object or meaning and fact. Um, I just wondered, in a sense, how these works interrelate in that moment, and 
Uh, we can go into something like how artists uh, such as Laurie Parsons almost chooses to kind of disappear, really, or kind of move away from the art world and these kind of value systems. Um, I mean, she's a fascinating figure. Do you want to talk about how Laurie came part of the show? It's interesting that the talk show format elicits a, f a certain kind of uh, grandstanding, soapbox, gossipy feeling that I've not felt so often before. Um, I assume most of us are in the art world to some degree. You know, I always hear this thing where people say, I want a major piece by that artist. Um, and, and I want an artist who can scale up and, and make important works and is an important artist. Um, and uh, in my mind, the, the biggest pieces by an artist are, are not always the best work by them. Um, I think student work, for instance, is so extraordinary. I think drawings are often as good as, as the, the much more important paintings by that artist. Um, and I think that there are outliers in the history of art that are also important. So uh, to, to, to actually talk about some art, it's really a show that I think um, uh, does well through observation. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate but necessary that we're all in this room. The, the art in the show doesn't really compete with anything. Um, it's so modest, you know, it's an old cardboard box and uh, some old pieces of wood. There's no way it can compete with the, the weight of this uh, speaker. So I highly recommend you come back and, and come on a gray day and spend a s slow time here. Mm -hmm. um, but okay, let's talk about some art. So this, this uh, sculpture, uh, I'm not sure of the title, is by a woman named Lori Parsons, um, an almost mythic figure. Uh, a number of these artists, you, you won't get a chance, you haven't gotten a chance thus far in your life to see their work in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it wouldn't surprise me if you, you don't again. I'm not sure Laurie Parsons' work has ever been seen uh, on this, this island. Um, Laurie is an artist who made work in the late 80s and early 90s for only a period of about three or four years. Uh, to give you some context, this sculpture was first shown in a group show and next to it was the two clocks by the artist Felix Gonzalez Torres called Perfect Lovers an emblem of our time. It was first shown next to this. And this is a box with about 300 documents in it, all of which were given to the artist. They're all very personal documents. They're, they're photographs of her own birth. Um, there's a letter in there, I believe, from her sister asking Lori if she would be interested in carrying um, her baby for her. Um, there's pictures of family members dying. Uh, it's a... It's, uh, it's a sculpture with incredibly high stakes, um, but also uh, uh, unbelievably boring everyness. You know, the, the, the figure of the everyman from, from, from plays and, and literature is somewhat lost, I think, in our life today. We like films that the protagonist is a superstar, a kind of superhero, um, and this is not a show about that, and this, this box it's very strange, we went through it. When this was first shown, um, you could take anything you wanted from it. Um, very much like a Felix Gonzalez Torres stack. You could just walk away with this woman's baby photo. Um, you could walk away with you know, a personal note to her. And now it's a, a static sculpture for the sake of uh, um, you know, art history. Uh, but as we were going through it, it was incredible because it was so bland. You know, we all have a box like this. Maybe not people in their 20s, you know, who just have it on a file now. But everyone else in the room, you know, has a box. Um, and something about the, the universality of it um, made it both very honest, um, uh, uh, but also relatable. That's what Proust says about Chardin, that, um, you know, you know what's in his, his, his artworks, and therefore, when you see those things in your real life, the light that Chardin casts on them in his depictions, you're able to cast that on them in your kitchen or your bedroom. You're able to say, ah, I see this, the, the beauty that Chardin saw it. Um. Mm. I think that the difference is, obviously the difference is between someone like uh, this work by Parsons and Felix's, Gonzalez Torres's work is that there's the reproducibility in Gonzalez Torres. And th these are in fact unique pieces that you know, have accumulated significance or 
seeming significance in Laurie Parsons' life. Um, and it's quite remarkable that she then decides to kind of disperse them in a kind of uh, ambivalent way. And we were saying, actually, I think, when we were going through the show, that our relationship to, like, the shoebox and the kind of objects that we, ha you know, I think a lot of people used to have in shoeboxes, old photographs and things like that, you know, currently digital technology and so on, those kind of shoeboxes maybe don't have the same, I don't know, amount of material, <laughs> let's say. Um, so that's interesting, that sort of significance of, of the time and position and that, that work was also constructed in 91. And I think similarly in 91, I think of America, New York, the AIDS crisis and various other kinds of things that have been thrown away and discarded at that time. So I think that work is quite emotionally and resonant. You know, the, it's interesting you pick even a, a part, or pick upon Felix Gonzalez-Torres' work as well, because that has certain yeah, chimes with that sort of moment, really. Mm. Um, but uh, I mean, other works in this show, such as Maury Davy, you know, seem you know, again, have that different kind of modes of, of time. This, I think this work was made originally in 1909, and this has been remade for this particular show in 2017. Um, and it also features the, I mean, this work is addressed to this gallery, so if you've had a chance to look at it, you can see the, you know, it's addressed to Hannah Narali Listen Gallery, and these kind of sticker tapes are a sort of ways in which the actual, it's folded up and sort of sent through the mail. Do you want to talk about this particular work and actually the two photographs that are in the, in piece. Uh, yeah, I think material fact, that's also a kind of a, a you know, a, a political interest I have to, instead of thinking solely about the theory of something, to think about how it, how it resolves itself into object form, and also to actually think about uh, the objects on display in a gallery in a very factual way. So the, the same painter, who's a friend of mine, who told me about Chardin's work, uh, around that same time, he was, he was making a painting of a found object, and it was taking him a very long time, and it was in his, his, his old studio in Brooklyn, and uh, he explained to me that dust was collecting on the surface of the object that he was depicting in his studio, and he couldn't, his painting of that object, he couldn't keep up with the speed with which the dust was forming on the sculpture. The dust, the speed of his skin, you know, flaking off and collecting in dust form was faster than his art. Um, uh, I thought that was a very beautiful truth. Um, and everything in this show, almost everything in this show has, has a, some wear and tear to it. Um, I, I, I don't know about you guys, I'm, I'm quite a fan of the reality of paintings, the back of paintings, you know, um, uh, how they age. Uh, so, and that's certainly the case for yeah. Lori Parsons, certainly the case for the, the room that we're in. Uh, the piece on the back wall, uh, which was shown here the very first year of this gallery, um, you know, that's a 50-year-old sculpture. Uh, I think it's important we realize that these objects also have a, uh, a life to them. So this... That's, sorry, that was learned, wasn't it, by the technician at the... Exactly. Yeah. That was, there's a lot of tie-ins uh, to the history of this gallery as well um, that, that play out in, in this exhibition. Uh, this, this work is by a great artist named Moira Davey, uh, um, who's a New York-based artist from Canada, I believe. Um, at the time she first made these works, she was living in New Jersey, and they are um, still lifes of her home in Hoboken. Uh, and uh, the one on the right is called Long Life, Cool White. It's one of her most important pictures. It's the title and uh, cover image of her first retrospective at Harvard some time ago. And uh, she then folded these pictures up, these very old, quite rare pictures. Uh, rather, I should say, I asked for this work, this very important work of hers to be in this show. And apparently there was a ding in it. Like when she took it out of her flat file, she saw that the image was imperfect. Uh, and rather than newly print it, which would probably mean digitally, uh, she converted it uh, to not be in a picture in a frame, but instead be a physical object that was then sent in the mail to Listen Gallery. And now bears not just the kind of uh, mechanics of the postal industry, but also the, um, you know, the traces of the postal worker's hand. And uh, you know whatever magazine was was next to these in the shipment rubbed off on them, um, and they have a certain um, 
wrinkling and age that is a quality I find very endearing in, in our mm. works. Um, so a lot of these works are, are despite their slowness and stillness, they're works that um, remain alive um, in a certain way. Like the, the, the Jeff Geis uh, sculpture behind us, which um, is, is uh, Chard no one ever saw Chardin paint. Um, it's, it's a strange fact that his 60 years of painting, how he made his paintings was a very closely guarded secret in an era when, you know, this is after the Renaissance, uh, you wouldn't have hidden how you painted. He, he was very excited, or I, I can't speak to his intent or his feelings, but nevertheless, he, nobody saw how he painted. And a number of the artists in the show, um, how they make their work is, is a bit of a mystery as well, um, from Laurie Parsons to Trisha Donnelly um, to Henrik Olesen. Um, but nevertheless, this sculpture is dated 1986, but on the box, uh, it clearly says 2012. Um, so how we resolve that conflict of, of time and, and the unfolding of a life, uh, I'll, I'll leave to you. I'm not sure where I was going, but... Mm. Yeah, we talked a little bit, because in the Patty Hill as well, that's sort of the notion mm -hmm. of time and how time is built into those works. Mm -hmm. um, and these sort of cosmologies that then built up around the sort of Xerox and the quality of the Xerox print. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit about how, and also even in Trisha Donnelly's work as well, the, the fact that that's a still image that then is being presented as, via a video projector, these kind of curious sort of ripples of time and how they're then presented. I mean, they're sort of, at, and even with the Dan Graham, they're reflecting off that sort of space as well. Yeah. Um, these obviously are conscious sort of decision makings. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, the thing that's closest to Chardin in, in the history of art is Dutch still life painting. Um, and when he first emerged, that's who he was compared with. And the Dutch still life painters, masters though they are, the bouquets are impossible because these flowers are from all four seasons, uh, you know, every continent. And the fact that they're put together in this inventive way is um, impossible physically, uh, but also um, you know impossible durationally. Uh, and Chardin, most of these still lifes are after the meal. You know they they remind me of these Wolfgang Tillman's uh, post studio party photographs, um, where it's just like you know the broken cups the morning after. Um, and uh, because of that, you know as we all know. The night before you throw a party, uh, setting it up, it's a very quick event. And, and the party is also a kind of quick event. But that morning when you go in and you see your sink and there are those dishes there, that lasts for years. Um, and uh, <laughs> that's what's depicted in a Chardin. You know, the fish is always uh, a little old and, and a little stale. The bread is stale. And Chardin, what's makes him, it's, it's what makes him so different from Corot. Um, so there's a woman in the show, I mean, biography is very important to a lot of these artists. There's a woman in the show named Patty Hill. Um, all these, if, if you get no more from the show than you look at Chardin again, that's great. That's really all I wanted. Um, uh, but then there's all these artists like Maud Solter, or B. Wirtz, or Laurie Parsons, um, or Patty Hill. They're just tremendous artists in their own right, and, and all of whom deserve retrospectives at the Tate Modern or the, Mom, uh, or the MoMA. Um, so pick one you like and just look into them. And uh, Like Moira has written many non-art books. I first discovered her work, uh, she wrote a, a uh, she edited a book on motherhood. Um, and at the time I was interested in Kleinian analysis of motherhood. Um, and she writes amazing, amazing, amazing non-art books. So likewise, this woman, Patty Hill, who um, has six objects in the show. She, she's the most well-represented artist in the show. She was an American um, who died, I think, not so long ago, two, three years ago. She was uh, first a supermodel. She was on the cover of some magazines. I think she was on the cover of Elle. And, uh, and then she was a... Uh, a novelist and a poet, and she was very close with Plimpton. She wrote for the Paris Review, and uh, at some point, as I understand it, um, her son had too much clutter. Um, her child had too much clutter, uh, and uh, 
she went to throw it away, the buttons and the marbles and the toys, and rather than just dismiss it forever, she took it to a copy shop and put it on the flatbed you know, copy machine and had a print made of it. Um, and she threw the actual objects away. And she had these sheets of paper instead. Um, and I think it, it's, it's not just a, a memento of um, you know, uh, those objects. It's also a memento of her relationship to this person. And she soon thereafter exhibited these very small, as you call them, A4 sheets of paper that are simply you know, Xeroxes. Uh, and then she had a very long career as an artist. She showed in Soho, she showed in France, and all she ever showed were these Xeroxes. Mm. Um, and they're all Xeroxes of an object to scale. Um, and in the room that immediately next to this, uh, there are three. One of them is of a man's shirt, quite simple. But the two that are the wings of, of this, um, I, I should say you should, you should look at them and not me because they're the most gorgeous prints. They, they compare, in my mind, to great Japanese photography. The contrast between black and white, the, the, the detail of, of uh, the grain of the toner as it gets spilled and then burnt. You know, there's no ink in a Xerox. A Xerox is literally powder that's sprinkled onto a sheet of paper in a certain configuration, and then a laser burns that powder into what we take to be an image. It's, it's very unlike a photograph, and it's very unlike a painting. It's its very own specific medium. Um, so the two pictures outside of this uh, Xerox of a sleeve, um, one of them looks like a constellation. It's a black sheet of paper with thousands of, of um, white stars, and it's actually a Xerox of dirt. And the last 15 or so years of this woman, Patty Hill's life, she uh, lived in France and was an artist in residence at Versailles. And she took her Xerox machine um, uh, to Versailles and just took some dirt off the ground and made a Xerox of it. So this dirt um, is noble dirt. The same way that Chardin, you know, uh, uh, it might be a cup of water. Nevertheless, it's a cup of water in the Louvre. Um, this dirt also has a certain kind of uh, uh, tremendous power and weight when it gets translated into this very flat sheet of paper. So, yeah, because yeah, in fact, it's quite an incredible story how she managed to get a photocopy. Did she was sat next to Charles Eames on a flight, yeah. and he knew the head of IBM? Is that right? Yeah, and Ray. And Ray, and uh, and so. They, they gave her um, a domestic, well, a photocopier yes. that she took into her life, and that's how she made so many works over that time. And there's details such as that she'd add her, you know, extra levels of tone and to create the density to the, the actual print that she wouldn't have able to, been able to have done in a you know, normal office setting. It's, it's, it's a good point. Uh, a thing that makes these artists uh, somewhat different than other shows that this show may resemble um, it's not junk art, and it's not found object art. Um, all of these artists, in my mind, possess a great degree of, of technical skill. Um, it's actually one of the, the critiques that was originally mounted against Chardin, that you know, great artists of the time invented, and all this man, he had no invention. Um, he just had skill. He just had facility. Um, he was very much just rooted in like in, in recreating what we might call realism. Um, and uh, none of the artists in the show are loose. Um, you know, Moira Davy is, is as good a f technical photographer as any. Um, these, the sculpture by Henrik Olesen, uh, which is untitled from 2017, uh, it took him, uh, I think, a month to make this sculpture. Uh, when we first invited him, um, and in my mind, he's, he's one of the great artists of our time, uh, it took him a while to, to respond uh, after he accepted being in the show. And I followed up and said, you know, what's going on? What's, what's, what? And he said, you know, I've, I keep looking for the right pieces of wood. And I'm bicycling around Berlin. And Berlin is so modern and so concrete now, I just can't find these exact pieces of wood that have the characteristics and, and subject 
that, that I'm, I know is to be inherent in this artwork. So my friend is renting a car, and we're going to drive someplace else to find this. Um, and in that way, all of these artists are much more like Duchamp um, than they are, you know, like George Herms um, or other kind of funk and, and detritus artists. There's an amazing book, this is a tie-in, that uh, Elena Filipovich just wrote about Duchamp called The Apparently Marginal Activities of Marcel Duchamp. And, and it shows that Duchamp is, is, is much more a mathematician than he is a jester. Um, and I think, all, I think everything in the show is in very good faith. Uh, you know, the Laurie Parsons opens it because nobody would say about this box of very personal photographs that it's a jab against art or it's a, a mockery of art. It's, it's much more invested, as I believe that Henrik Olufsen is very invested. And this B works. Um, this is a 30-year-old sculpture that, that I think is, uh, you know, B's work, um, all of it comes from three things, shelter, food, or clothing. Um, so it's not stuff that's found on the street. It's not discarded stuff. It's stuff from his own home that allows him to survive. Um. Mm. But I think also, aesthetically, I think when I walk through this space, I can see this, uh, the, uh, the sort of notational elements of things. So for instance, the marks on these, Murray Davies, or the, the sort of marks here on the Henrik Olsen, they sort of allude to a kind of language or a system of, as you talk about, a system of uh, meaning. And similarly, in the Hannah, more, more specifically in the work of Hannah Dubberman's work as well, mm -hmm. this sort of mark making and language and how this kind of creates a kind of cryptic or mythological even mm -hmm. uh, way of which how we, we might interrelate or kind of see how these works might mean something. I think um, Henry Olsen, the previous instances with these woodworks, he did uh, portraits of his mother and father. Um, and so, but these are untitled, so these, we don't know who these are necessarily ascribed to. Um, so again, this is sort of leveling or spacing between uh, feeling, affect, and kind of uh, abstract and material found objects and how they may be isolated or felt through. I think there's a very sort of sensitive and instinctive way of feeling through this show um, that really comes through some of these works in a very delicate way. Um, I think upstairs we get more uh, through the works of Maud Salter and Cameron Rowland, a kind of different uh, position here of how things might be brought about. And I think they have a, a more even a richer or deeper kind of political instances that have resonate through those works. Do you, do you want to sort of talk a bit about how the framing of that, that, that particular room came together? Yeah. Uh, a, a thing you said early, th thank you, uh, early in, in, in that uh, had to do with mark making. And uh, I think writing is, is very important uh, to a lot of these artists. Um, the two subtexts, two, two of the subtexts of all of, of the work in the show has to do with um, uh, gender and writing. Um, if you think of a still life from the get-go, uh, you know, a still life, a tabletop, a horizontal surface, um, whether it's a concrete ledge, um, or a, a, a Xerox machine. These are traditional spaces, not of depiction, but of writing. Um, and also, uh, a Chardin still life uh, is almost always an interior space. It's a kind of very domestic space. So uh, as you look at these objects, to, to think about text and the object as a text, uh, as, as, a, as a horizontal surface and, and uh, an object meant to bear the marks of the subjectivity of its author, not just the artist, um, and also the gender of these. Um, as far as the politics of, of some of the works, um, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, to me, it, if, I, yeah. if I may, I mean, I find that that sculpture, the Henrik Olsen, be a rather political um, uh, uh, statement of a sort. Mm -hmm. But so, so upstairs, nevertheless, there's a room with... Um, well, can I, can I talk about something else that's Absolutely, very important? Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, there's, there's an element about this gallery uh, that, that I, I uh, you know, I, uh, to think of the exhibition in and of itself as a kind of still life um, and how it's arranged. Uh, Chardin, like his, his protege, Cezanne, um, 
left his compositions in a kind of disarray. You know, the oranges and apples are never in a kind of perfect triangle, they're always in a bit of a mess. Um, and I think Chardin did that. And the installation of this gallery is, is very asymmetrical and, and lopsided and uneven. Um, and many people have written about how uh, Chardin and his paintings, uh, they don't, he doesn't focus on a single thing. Everything is equally depicted um, from the tablecloth to the object depicted on it. Um, and, and I really thought about that uh, in the context of this room both the physical architecture of this room and the history of this gallery. So, you know, one thing that this was sent, uh, not to me, um, but to, you know, the person who kind of co-organized the show, Hannah, at this gallery. Um, so a very important uh, uh, artist to me, a kind of Chardin of our times, is a man named Michael Asher. Um, if you don't know Michael's work, I, I highly recommend uh, spending some time um, he did many, 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 many shows um, and made no, 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 no objects. Um, so you really had to experience his artworks in person to understand them. And he did a show at this gallery in 1973, I guess it was, in, in a kind of basement exhibition space. Uh, he visited the site, as I understand. And all he did was he, at the base of the wall, where the wall met the floor, he cut a reveal um, in that gutter, as, as some would say. Uh, he cut a reveal into the base of the wall, I believe a quarter of an inch tall and an inch and a half deep, quite a deep reveal. Um, and he did it so that the wall was then seen as an object in and of itself. You know, we took the wall for granted that it was a given. And Asher wanted to say, no, no, the wall is also you know, an ideological and, and, and very physical thing that we should not take for granted. So he cut the bottom of it so it would be free-floating. Um, this is a show most people who would have seen it would have seen nothing. A show that would make, you know, the cardboard boxes in, in this show seem like, you know, uh, Baroque <laughs> uh, extravagances. Uh, and and, and uh, nevertheless, that's a show that, that formed the moment when all galleries started to have floating walls. And now every gallery we go to has these floating walls. Um, and it's really the result of this very small, somewhat you know, minor exhibition at this gallery. Um, yeah, I think in a sense they're picking up more on the biographical histories than are presented here. Because um, those that what you're talking about, the Michael Asher is depicted in a series of photographs taken by Nicholas Logsdale back in the day, um, and they're included alongside Jeff Gee's documentation about how he'd like his work shown here. Um, and so there is this sort of interrelation of the gallery and the history of the gallery, and also just the this, this sort of quasi status of an object or how that appears as an artwork or not, and this kind of uh, what's left of something or the, the remnants really. Um, and how they're charged with some sort of emotional, historical affect, yeah. Yes. I, would, I would dispute that it was a minor show, because the whole gallery was, in, it was the whole gallery, and the whole gallery was empty. Mm. And you actually had to find this in the farthest mm. from, from the gallery, so you had to go through, you had to go in two, three, four, this was the fifth room in the basement before you found this, and most people. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I think that 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 contradiction between minor and major is very important. We all take that on. There's a, there's a man named Brandon Joseph who wrote a book about uh, a person named Tony Conrad, and the the subtitle of the book is about minor histories. And in this book, he kind of makes the claim that Tony Conrad is the most important artist of the last 40 years, not just you know, to a select coterie, but also the most influential, that he affected rock music, um, that he affected you know, film, that he affected TV, more than any other artist, um, but was a minor figure, nevertheless. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the contradiction is that this show that 
Asher and, and, and Nicholas did was a you know, elaborate but minor um, articulation in the space that had gigantic ramifications for the next 50 years. Um, we physically did it ourselves in three weeks, well, every day. How did, you, how did you do it? Yeah. And then we had to, where we chipped it to mark, we had to build it up again to get it straight down. But something that is, the, the, the question, the other question here is, so why have galleries or galleries adopted this? Nearly all galleries. Hmm. Do you know why? I do not. Uh, nothing to do with my connection. <laughs> um, but I think it came from my connection. And uh, uh, we actually discovered it. Michael and I discovered this when we were painting. We, we had to paint the wall. So if you put a piece of cardboard underneath into the gap, you don't get paint on the floor, which means that in a, in a big space, yeah. you take this piece of cardboard, right, or whatever it is, you know, something physically that you put under, uh, you don't have to worry about painting that mm. fine line and getting it straight mm. between the floor and the wall. And that's why the actual line itself has to be very straight, mm. Mm. because otherwise it looks yeah. Like a, a Mickey Mouse. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, which, in the old days, before people adopted this, most gallery walls, there was really a problem mm -hmm. between where the wall and the floor met. And also, the other thing that, uh, I mean, I, I, would, I would say also this idea probably came from my whole thinking about John McCracken. Oh, really? Because the planks connected the floor mm. to the wall without going anywhere near that bit. Mm. So that it left that for my. Mm. The, so that, isn't that interesting? I think this is a very important uh, and, and crucial part of the narrative that's often told. Uh, but this part is left out. I, I agree. In my mind, the American arm of institution. Well, Michael, Michael was not at all approved of this being mentioned at all. But you know, you have to ask the question: Why mm. has adopted it? Not in commerce, my pleasure. I'm sure you're aware of that. But yeah. there's a reason for it. I'd like to explain, and just as there's a reason why Shadow has said something very interesting, which you, I thought you were going to mention. But the reason that what you said about the scale and the modesty of the scale has to be very thoughtfully considered, just as the Michael Asher shadow gap was, is in those days art was sold by the square set. So clearly he had no financial ambitions. Whereas other artists, you know, the bigger painting. Mm more square, square centimeters, the more expensive it was. And artists were literally priced like stock market uh, um, indices. Uh, they were priced uh, according to their status first moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Rubens was pretty expensive. And so were a few others. But this was half the Renaissance, it wasn't. I mean, this was the, the sort of, well, it was from the 18th century, I want to maybe say. I agree with and I'm very grateful for, for all of those insights. I also think the American wing of institutional critique comes out of West Coast light and space art. Um, I don't think we would have John Knight without James Terrell. Um, and uh, Asher, I once asked him where he came from uh, in lineage, and he said Flavin, actually. Uh, as far as utility goes, I think utility, what a... You know, I don't think the machine and the artwork are as at odds as, as some might say. You know, I think the utility, um, I mean, Chardin painted all these devices of utility. Um, and so many of the objects in the show, uh, you know, the logistical side of them remains present. You know, that this is a cardboard box um, with packing tape on it. 
remains, that the B works works, and two that are in the other galleries. The device that holds the sculpture on the wall, uh, there's another one sitting on top of the sculpture. So what's on display is, is how, it, how it works. And, and even the Olison works, um, he was very clear in conveying to us that the screws that hold these works up against the wall are a fundamental um, uh, 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 part of the artwork. Um, and, and, and also this, this, this point about Chardin making a very active decision to keep doing what he was doing, the scale he was doing it, and, and to not scale it up um, is, is all the advice I can give to, to an artist is to, to maintain the work per the work's own logic and not per um, the scale of, and hierarchy of genres that I think is still very prevalent. Mm. You talk to me about how Chardin's work is often misframed, or you know, the framing of it is actually often incorrect. That they actually, because the, uh, the the darkness or the sort of black space that runs under it is seen as not part of the painting, and so they often cover it over. Do you want to talk? About, I mean, that's kind of interesting oh, yeah. detail. This is yeah, a, it, uh, yeah um, to the six or seven viewers out there on the internet. Um, if you Google Chardin in a moment and and try and see the thing we're talking about. Uh, as I did when I first, you know, kind of got excited about Chardin, there's a, uh, a contradistinction between the way Chardins appear on the internet and even in books and how they appear in real life. Um, uh, the scale is almost the same, but uh, most of these Chardin still lifes, um, the center point of the painting is the table or the concrete ledge um, the upper third of the painting, you know, is the, you know, uh, nature morgue, the actual still life. And the bottom third of the still life is, you know, the place under the table, the, you know, the front of the concrete wall. And often uh, these get edited out um, when the uh, artwork gets reproduced. Um, I've seen this in Mirandi as well. You know, so much of a Mirandi is just, you know, the empty space of the tabletop. Um, and I've noticed even, even in quite important museums, they'll have the frame covering up part of the composition. Um, th the same way that a, that a painting like this, if we send this to, you know, our, our, you know, the photo editor of certain publication, if they're generous enough to write a review of this. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we'll see where the, the crop marks go. Um, yeah. mm. I know Tillman's has a big problem with uh, cropping um, magazine reproductions and so on. We, here's where Chardin gets, gets me. I saw this, this gorgeous Tillman's show um, recently in, in, in Basel, a kind of retrospective. And uh, I saw in two different areas in the show, um, there were like four pieces of tape around where a photograph had been, and then I think the photograph was taken out, and uh, somebody, you know, Tillman's or an uh, art handler, mm -hmm. overlooked these little clear pieces of tape. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I would have seen them had I not looked so intently at Chardin over the years and focused uh, my gaze on, on something so soft. But also because of Chardin, mm -hmm. I found these tape mark, these pieces of tape quite lovely. You know, quite full of truth and realism and utility um, uh, to see the apparatus mm. in, its, in its very basic form. Mm. Yeah. I'm just conscious of a bit of time. If anyone's got any questions, um, should we maybe open it up to general questions or we can still carry on talking? Or? Critiques are also welcome. <laughs> I think we've been going for a while, haven't we? Yeah. Going for an hour or so. How so. long? How long? When, when was it you focused? What, um, what was the first impulse to focus on Chardin? Oh, yeah. Did, did everybody hear that? Okay, I said, what was the... When, when did you focus on Chardin, Chardin and, and, and actually notice what you're speaking of? Which is, you know, uh, to my mind, very truthful. I mean, it's not, it's not just a, a kind of uh, theoretical interpretation. 
It's there before your very eyes, and I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, for anybody who wants to double check that, there's a book up there. We, did, we were thinking of actually trying to get an original, but it was too complicated. Mm. And, and then we thought, well, actually, it's not so necessary. Yeah. Um, a book will do. Uh, so, I, answer the question, please. <coughs> the, the, the majority of, not the majority, but the largest holdings of Chardin in the world are at the Louvre, you know, where they've always been. And, and most of them are in these uh, glass cabinets. And uh, it's an amazing thing if you go, it's almost always the case. Uh, and you look at the painting, you can see a face in front of the painting. And, and I surmise, having done it myself, that that's because the power of the painting is so great that when you're looking at it, you literally stare and put, you, you, you bump your face <laughs> into this glass. And I've like done it and been like, okay, there's glass there, keep your distance. And then the, the, the beholding of this painting is so great, it happens again. And there's all these like face marks all over the glass. Um, so, in, in fact, in person, they are quite, quite powerful. I mean, I think one, one thing to, to say um, about Chardin in this show is that I, I also have a day job, and uh, in, in deciding to do uh, a show outside of my day job, uh, I wanted it to be, again, like a, my yoga, you know? Like a thing I, 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 that, that wasn't necessarily productive, but was a thing that... that I found very relaxing, um, as I, I find Chardin to be, and, and, and I find the objects in this show also have a great peace um, and, and sense to themselves. Uh, it was not so long ago that I discovered Chardin, maybe four or five years ago, um, and uh, he, this, is, this is cruel, but he makes, he makes Manet into a cartoonist. Yeah, yeah interesting point. Um, I, I, would you agree that, um, um, I mean, well, you have a gallery, so you have the same, I, I would assume you get asked the same question, which is, um, how do you know that something's good? Or what, what, what alerts you to look at something? Because you know, it's a vast, vast production of art today go to any art fair, most of it's not any good. And the stuff that looks most like art is the stuff that's least likely to be any good. Most likely, sorry, not to be any good. Mm. You know what I'm trying to say. Mm. Not any good. Yeah. Um, and I think this show illustrates that point very well because the, the, the art that doesn't look like art, mm. that is to say, it's not artistic, mm. is likely to be either rubbish or, very importantly, highly significant. But you've got to interpret it, you've got to actually have the key to the language, or you have to be, you know, uh, yeah, I think you really have to have the key to the language. And the, 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 the really impressive thing about this show is that your discussion about Shadan is the key that unlocks the language of this show. And I think that's very beautiful, and congratulations. Mm -hmm.